to get the gang. You send them out. Well, I'll be seeing you later, So today I am going to talk about a series of historic films that you may or may not have heard of called Baby Burlesque. And yes, it is as ridiculous and disturbing as it sounds. From roughly 1931 to 1933, which was during the Great Depression, a series of short black and white films known as Baby Burlesque were produced that featured child actors. And in these roughly 10 minute films, these children were paid to act out scenes that were more of a uh, adult nature, for lack of a better word. This included mature attire and sexually suggestive behavior and language. So in summary, these films were meant to be comedies where children would reenact the lives of actual adults. And so these children were extremely sexualized and these films were also very misogynistic and very racist. And these films were actually where Shirley Temple got her start in showbiz. Her first film was a baby burlesque flick called The Runt Page in 1931 or 1932. Sources vary on the exact year when it actually came out. But this was how Shirley Temple got her start in the film industry. And based on the knowledge that Shirley Temple was around three years old when she starred in these films, it's safe to say that the other child actors were around this age as well. The children are meant to be presented in a quote unquote comical light where they would wear these ridiculous diapers and these crazy oversized little pins on the front to hold the diapers up. And this attire juxtaposed the adult attire that they would also wear, as well as the mature nature of the film itself. And I find it very interesting how societal norms evolve over time and throughout history. I think it's a very important part of understanding history, especially when we are applying a contemporary lens on historic events. And also the fact that it's just weird, okay? It's just weird and I like talking about weird shit and exposing it and a lot of people don't know about baby burlesque. So before I dive deep into this whole baby burlesque film craze, I wanna give you guys a little background on where it comes from, who produced it, so on and so on. Baby burlesque films were produced by a company called Educational Pictures, also known as Educational Films Corporation of America or Educational Film Exchanges, Inc. It was a film production and distribution company that was created in 1916 by an American film producer named Earl Hammonds, or Hammonds, one of those, I think. And you might also be wondering, like myself, what the hell is a film production company with a name like Educational Pictures doing creating films like this? It just makes it even stranger, you know? Well, initially the company's intent was to produce educational films for schools, and they did, for a time, until they decided to switch gears and focus on more comedic endeavors, if you call this comedy. Because again, this was during the Great Depression and so people needed a laugh. And I guess baby burlesque was the answer to their issues. Actually, after doing some research, I learned that people didn't really have an issue with the baby burlesque films. They thought it was cute and adorable and hilarious and it was a hoot. It wasn't until a few years later that people started to side eye it and go like, maybe, maybe we dropped the ball on this one. This, this one, this is a little disturbing. And it is, it is extremely disturbing. Like it, it reminded me of that French film that came out, that coming of age French film that was on Netflix. God, what was it called? And and it was like, it went viral. People were disturbed and disgusted. I was too. I saw bits and pieces of it and I was like, oh no, this is not okay. God, what was it called? I literally just searched French film, children, Netflix. Let's see. 
cuties. There we go. French film, children, Netflix ban. Yeah. So th this baby burlesque stuff, it reminds me of a, an older version of cuties. I mean, not the same thing, obviously, you know, cuties was more of like a coming of age, uh, I guess, serious movie, whereas baby burlesque is meant to be funny, but in essence, I wanted to wash my eyes out with bleach on both occasions. So same thing. And so today we're gonna do something a little different for this video. I'm gonna watch these videos. I was able to find all of them for the most part, except for one. There are nine baby burlesque videos total. And I don't know if I have the constitution or want to watch all of it. So I'm gonna watch as much of it as I can. So the first film I reluctantly decided to watch is called War Babies. And I have to say as a viewer, if you are completely unfamiliar with the whole baby burlesque genre, and this is your first time watching one of these films, the shock factor is overwhelming. The film starts off showing the viewer that this scene is taking place at an establishment called Buttermilk Pete's Cafe. And actually the entire film takes place here. Immediately, we see a group of gun-toting children entering Pete's Cafe dressed in diapers who can only be perceived to be soldiers of some kind. Not sure if it matters, but I later found out that they are Yankee soldiers, to be more specific. Once we get a full inspection of the interior of this establishment, we learn that Buttermilk Pete's Cafe is really a bar for babies. There's a baby quartet entertaining the bar's customers, accompanied by none other than Shirley Temple who plays a French barmaid named Charmaine. And as an aside, I, I don't think I've ever met a baby or a child named Charmaine. This is just an observation from my personal experience that I realized and I found to be kind of odd. When I think of the name Charmaine, I think of a full adult woman. In this opening scene, Charmaine is also entertaining the bar's guests with a dance while wearing an off the shoulder top accompanied by diapers that are clasped with this ludicrously oversized safety pin. And actually all of the children in this film are wearing this diaper safety pin get up. Shirley mentions in her autobiography that her mother actually created this outfit for the film. Some of the children are wearing nothing but the diaper and oversized safety pin, and this includes the quartet. As the quartet plays, they watch on as Shirley dances for the guests. The piano player becomes so hypnotized by her beauty that he suddenly stops playing whatever tune they were playing from the beginning and starts to play The Streets of Cairo. And you may or may not know the name of the song, but I'm pretty certain you've heard it before, either in a cartoon or a movie. And you sometimes hear it in scenes where there's a snake charmer or a belly dancer. It's not until one of the piano player's fellow musicians whacks him that he snaps out of it. Now at this point, I am already feeling a little uncomfortable watching this film, and we're only a minute into this nine minute film. After this disturbing scene, the camera changes focus to the bar area where we meet a character named Captain Flag for the first time, who is played by Georgie Smith. Georgie Smith is a child actor who Shirley Temple will work with a lot in these baby burlesque films. Captain Flag is ordering another drink or a bottle of milk. And as the bartender begins opening the bottle, all of a sudden milk just squirts all over the child's face and he begins screaming and crying. Now this might seem like a silly observation to you, but as we go on, you'll understand what I mean. Milk being poured, squirted, or dumped on children's faces in this film becomes a reoccurring thing. And it, and it just becomes stranger and stranger over time. And God, just, just saying that makes me feel super uncomfortable. And again, you might think that I'm reading into this too much, but, but trust me, I'm not. <laughs> After Captain Flag drinks his bottle of milk, he pays the bartender. And this scene is very important because it establishes the meaning behind future scenes. We learn from this one scene where Captain Flag pays for his drink that the form of currency in this world, 
is lollipops. Captain Flag hands the bartender one small lollipop and the bartender proceeds to place it in a cash register. Now keep this knowledge in the back of your head and just save it for later. After this interaction, the camera pans back to Shirley Temple or the barmaid Charmaine who is still dancing for these little boys. One of the little boys is eating an ice cream cone and it just so happens that the ice cream falls off the cone and into Charmaine's diaper causing her to gyrate and dance even more. And as I was watching this, I just kept thinking to myself, someone thought of this idea, someone wrote it down, circulated it, other people thought it was great, approved it, shared the script with these children's parents. The parents thought it was good. And at no point did anyone go, you know, maybe, maybe this is just a little weird. At this point, Charmaine catches the eye of none other than Captain Flag himself. And as Captain Flag is watching her, he leans over to another child at the bar and asks him what he thinks of Charmaine. What I found to be most interesting about this scene between these two little boys is that after the little boy responds to Captain Flag, Flag refers to him as a boy. Now granted, these are little boys, obviously, but I noticed that at no other point during this entire film does any of the other characters refer to any other characters as boy. And I thought, huh, well, that's interesting because of the history behind using the word boy to describe black men during this time in US history. It was used to dehumanize and demasculinize black men. And remember, these children are supposed to be pantomiming adult behaviors. So I found it super interesting that the creators of this film included it in the script. I'm just picturing the writers sitting in a room discussing the creation of this film and just thinking, now, now we need to remain true to ourselves, gentlemen. So Captain Flag beckons Charmaine to the bar by enticing her with a lollipop. Now remember, we learned earlier that lollipops are a form of currency in this world. Come in, I Charmaine comes over and accepts this lollipop in exchange for her attention, but Charmaine wants more lollipops because, you know, she, she's a gold digger. So she attempts to steal more lollipops from Captain Flag before he stops her. Captain Flag obliges her, but strictly warns Charmaine that this is the last one and that he's not made of money. When Charmaine pockets the new lollipop into her purse, we learn that Charmaine has an assortment of lollipops, suggesting that she has exchanged her attention or affections with many other boys for lollipops. Okay, 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 okay. Now it was at this point while watching this film that I had to take five because again, in my mind, I'm sitting here thinking someone thought of this for public consumption. Let that marinate. What they're implying is just disturbing beyond words. So now we are about three and a half minutes into the film and the viewer is just assaulted by a barrage of back-to-back -back random inappropriately suggestive scenes. In one scene, the camera pans over to the same character who was called boy earlier. And in this scene, the child is performing what can only be described as a table dance or strip tease for a group of child soldiers. And when I tell you, it was really difficult to watch that scene i mean it was just i mean it was just horrible and then as this little boy is performing this table strip dance the camera pans over to another scene that's taking place simultaneously where a child is trying to grab a bottle of milk that he can't reach again more milk. So he shakes the table to tip over the bottle. And yet again, we are met with a disturbing scene of milk and children. Just as the previous scene with milk, the child cries because his face is covered in milk. And then the audience learns that there are in fact two types of milk. They're sour and sweet. And I'll leave it up to you all to guess which milk poured all over this child. Let me breathe. Let me see if my therapist is on speed dial. Charmaine then rushes over to the little boy to save the day so he can drink sweet milk from this makeshift teat that Charmaine creates from a rubber glove. Like this whole scene is super disturbing for multiple reasons and 
why is there sour milk? I mean, I know that that's just like one of the issues here, but that that's the one that I can't shake. Like, wh why, why does the milk have to be sour? In the next scene, we are first introduced to the character Sergeant Quirt, played by Eugene Butler. Sergeant Quirt enters the bar with two little girls on each arm to really drive home to the audience that he is a player. Oh, that Sergeant Quirt, boy, he sure knows how to get the gang. Out. Although Sergeant Quirt is a ladies man, he sends the two young dames on their way because who he really has eyes for is none other than Charmaine, the barmaid of course. Sergeant Quirt greets Charmaine and immediately gets in a verbal confrontation with Captain Flagg who has already claimed Charmaine for himself. In an attempt to win this fight, Captain Flagg gives Charmaine a lollipop that is way bigger than the previous two he gave her. And of course, Charmaine is much obliged, but obviously Sergeant Quirt does not like this at all. So as Charmaine hugs Captain Flag, Sergeant Quirt steals the lollipop out of Charmaine's purse and re-gifts it to her in an attempt to make her his. And remember, lollipops are a form of currency here. But we haven't even gotten to the worst scene yet. Oh no! The creators of War Babies saved the best, or in this case, the most disturbing scene for last. The film comes to a close when a child messenger comes into the bar to inform the child soldiers that they must return to the front line for battle. Come on, Mom. Captain Flagg calls to Charmaine before he leaves for war. Charmaine peeks from behind a wall and offers him a flower as a token of her affection for him to take with him. As Charmaine is hugging Captain Flagg, Sergeant Quirt pops out of the same room that Charmaine came from and kisses her on the lips unbeknownst to Captain Flagg. But wait, it gets worse. The two gentlemen decide to have one final glass of milk before they leave for battle. Flagg warns Quirt to stay away from his baby, Charmaine the barmaid. Quirt tells him that Charmaine is his baby and in response to this, Flagg shows off the flower Charmaine gave him from her hair. In an attempt to one-up Flagg, Quirt brandishes Charmaine's safety pin, alluding to Charmaine having given it to him from her diaper. I got a seizure watching that. And at this point, I am pretty sure as the viewer, you've already put two and two together here. I I don't think I need to connect the dots here to show what the creators of this film were trying to imply. Like, you, we know, and it's fucked up. Why, why would you make something like this? Why? What the fuck is wrong with you? I've never been that depressed. I know y'all went through a world war, and then a depression, and then another war, and then influenzas and shit, and polio. But goddamn, leave the children alone. It's weird. And in scene, that's the end of War Babies. In Shirley Temple's 1988 autobiography, Child Star, Shirley describes what it was like being on the set of these baby burlesque films. And it's truly disturbing. It's just as disturbing as I 
thought it would be. She recounts her experience on the set of War Babies. She talks about the two men who were the ones in charge on the set, the director, Charles Lamont, and the producer, Jack Hayes. She describes Charles Lamont as shark-like and ominous. At the beginning of filming, Lamont gathered all of the child actors together and told them, this is business, time is important, you are not here to play, this is work. She then describes Hayes as an impatient man who had a distaste for erratic behavior, and so she was very leery of him. And remember, these children aren't even five years old, so these men are expecting these children to act like adults, essentially, or at least, you know, teenagers, which is super unrealistic. All 12 of the children were scared of Lamont, and when the children were, quote, disobedient, Lamont would threaten to put them in what Shirley describes as a large black box. It was a portable workstation for sound technicians, and it was six feet in length on all sides. The box had a narrow soundproof door, which was its only entrance and exit. It had no ventilation, so the inside was humid and hot. Lamont had two of these boxes, one for sound mixing and one to punish the children. Shirley describes children being thrust inside these boxes and at times for the smallest of infractions. And I say that as quoting Shirley because obviously it, it doesn't matter what a child does. A child should never be thrown into the, a, a dark box, you know, humid box. I mean, with no ventilation, that, that's child abuse, of course. And when the child entered the box, they saw nothing but a block of ice. And after being in the box for such a long time, the child would obviously grow tired. And so the child would then be faced with three options, either standing for extended periods of time, lying down in a cold puddle of water, or sitting on a block of ice. Shirley describes being forced to endure this form of abuse several times on set. And to prevent the children from quote, tattling to their parents, Lamont threatened them with the black box. Shirley, however, built up the courage to tell her mother about this abuse, and in response, her mother didn't believe her. Child welfare on this set was definitely an issue. The children were separated from their mothers during filming, and the mothers were excluded from the set at all times to ensure that the producer and director had complete control. The mothers were permitted to do their hair and fix their clothing, but then they were ushered to a waiting room for the duration of the day, and these children worked long hours. Because the mothers were not permitted on set, a so-called child welfare supervisor was supposed to be on set with these children, but production also found this to be problematic. So this child welfare supervisor was encouraged to leave after ushering the children on set and then disappear to a nearby dressing room with entertainment and refreshments for the duration of filming. The welfare supervisor would not return until the end of the shift. So really, there was absolutely no point in this person even being there. They did nothing to protect these children. Now, I don't know what the rest of the children made, but Shirley shared in her autobiography that for these baby burlesque films, she made anywhere from 40 to $50 per film. And in today's money, this ranges from 817 to a little over $1,000. Now this is probably just a fraction of the disturbing events that transpired on those sets, especially because most people don't remember everything that happened to them at four years old. I'm really surprised that Shirley Temple was able to recount the details of these events so many years later. But you know, then again, like these are very traumatic events in her life. And so trauma can sometimes be hard to remember and sometimes hard to forget, but one can only guess the full extent of what these children went through. I lamented over doing this video up until the final edits for quite some time, hence it taking me so long to finish it. As a creator, I have to walk this fine line where I want to share information, but I also don't want to be part of the problem. I don't want to add to the exploitation of these children, and so I tried my best to convey this during the editing of this film by including as much contextual imagery and footage as I could without including the most disturbing parts. 
Something else I thought about while researching for this video was how much I hate when people try to excuse past events and ideologies because, well, you know, it was a different time. Times were different then. This reasoning is such an excuse. It's a crutch to justify disturbing actions committed by people in the past. In this specific case, I like to call it the pedal loophole. Oh, but they didn't know any better. How would they know it was so long ago? Empathy is not a behavior that just came about during the 21st century. Whether from the past or present, we are all sentient beings. Well, most of us are. And what makes these baby burlesque films even more interesting is that just a few years after the release of these films, the same audience that supported them and found them to be hilarious voiced their distaste for them. Now, while I think it is important to apply a historical lens when revisiting past events, I don't think we should completely discard a contemporary one either. I mean, this approach allows us as humans to gain insight into where we came from and what direction we are headed in. So no, I don't excuse what happened to these children or the people who were involved in the making of these films, especially knowing what we know now about sexual predators in the entertainment industry. I think a perfect example of this is Natalie Portman in Leon the Professional. Remember that movie? Natalie Natalie was 12 years old in the film and the relationship between her character and this grown ass man, Leon, and the way she was depicted was super inappropriate. Then we find out later that the director allegedly participated in predatory behavior himself, allegedly. And then I just recently learned about this Canadian TV show from the 1980s called Just Like Mom while I was watching a YouTuber I really enjoy called Patrick CC. And Just Like Mom was a children's game show where children were separated from their parents and asked the question. Their parents were then brought out and asked the same question, and if their answers matched, they would win points. But anyway, the show was hosted by a married couple, Catherine Swing and Fergie Olver. The husband, Fergie Olver, was an absolute creep. The way he would interact with little girls on the show was just super inappropriate and disturbing. And what makes this so crazy is that it was all captured on TV. I think you have green eyes. Blue. Are they? They're not blue. Now don't tell me that. Look at me a little closer. They're green. <laughs> are your eyes green? Boy, are they ever pretty. Wow. Did many boys comment on your eyes? Hugs and kisses. I should have known a sweet looking gal like you would pick that one. You give out kisses though, don't you, Steph? No. Oh, you don't too? All right, wait, you like hugging and kissing? <laughs> no kisses. Can I have a little kiss, please? Oh. Yeah. You got any boyfriends? Yeah, one. One boyfriend? What do you do to when you're alone together, what do you do too? And this was the 1980s. That's why I feel like that whole idea of, well, it was a different time does not apply. Here we are in the 1980s, literally 60 years later, and we're still watching some weirdo exploiting children on TV. So that was baby burlesque. The exploitation and sexualization of children, displays of racism and sexism all wrapped up into one, with a bow. This is probably one of the most disturbing topics I have ever covered so far on this channel. Before I get out of here quickly, I just want to briefly thank the people who recently subscribed to my channel. When I started making these videos, it was, I just wanted to do it for fun and that still is the case. I love making these videos. I'm an amateur historian, if you will, and I'm a librarian. And so this is something that I am truly passionate about. To many people, 300 something subscribers, it, it sounds like absolutely nothing. But for me, the way I look at it, it's over 300 people standing in a room who give a shit about what I have to say. So thank you for your support. And who knows, maybe one day my dream of doing this full time will come true. All right, I'm gonna go get some pizza. This is definitely a pizza night after this.